Welcome to Reporters here on France 24 and welcome to this week's reporter, Marine Pradel, who's been looking at the plight of Turkish exiles. They've fled their country, many fearing for their life, many now living in fear. Now, Marine has been talking to many of these people and I'm wondering how you managed to trace them, actually, Marine, given that they're hiding out in fear of their lives, worried about being found by the Turkish secret services. Well, it took us months just to convince them to talk to us, to trust us. They were living in fear in, in Greece or in the Balkans where they, have, they had fled right after leaving Turkey. Uh, and there they were talking to us about threats, about being followed in the streets. And when we eventually went and filmed the story, they had moved to Germany for a safer place. But even there, they were looking over their shoulder all the time. And this is also why in the story that you'll see, um, very few shots are taken outside because we, we weren't allowed to not even sh shoot uh, a shot from the building or in the neighborhood of the streets they live in in case you gave away where they were and obviously put their lives even more at risk. Marine, thank you very much indeed. Let's take a look at Marine's film then, The Hunt for Turkey's Exiles. Das Verb ist rot. Wo steht das Verb im Satz wo? A language class for asylum seekers in a small town in the center of Germany. All the students come from Africa or the Indian subcontinent. All that is but one. Two years ago, Jevheri Guven was still living on the edge of Europe in Istanbul. I don't know when I'll be able to return to Turkey. I have to work to adapt. That's why I'm learning German. Jevheri was the editor of Nokta, a weekly magazine that backs the Gulen movement, named after its founder and spiritual leader, who was accused of instigating the failed coup of July 2016 in Turkey. Since then, all members of the organization have become targets for the Turkish authorities. All those linked to the Gulen movement are considered terrorists. In my case, in addition to supporting the Kurds, who Erdogan opposes, my links with the Gulen movement became public and I was labelled a terrorist. Erdogan directly threatened me on television before I was arrested. In September 2015, the magazine crossed a red line, criticizing the Turkish president as a warmonger by publishing a photo montage edited as if Erdogan was taking a selfie in front of a soldier's coffin. The price for Jevheri? He was arrested and sentenced to 22 years in prison. Secrecy was always part of the Gulen Brotherhood's culture, but it has also become a way of life for their followers, turned refugees in Europe. Jeff Herry is one of the few to testify openly. <laughs> Aged between 35 and 50 years old, they're engineers, academics, businessmen, either sympathizers or supporters of the Gulen movement. They first fled to the nearest countries, Greece or the Balkans, but there, they insist, Turkey's intelligence services, the MIT, and representatives of the ruling party, the AKP, are everywhere. They threatened me, they threatened me with death. So without telling my family, not even my wife or my mother or father, I went to Serbia the very next day. I was accused because I financially assisted the Gulen movement. I have been in Germany for six months. Before that, I stayed in Kosovo for eight months. When I was in Kosovo, it was rumored that Turkish secret services were conducting operations there. I didn't feel safe, so I came to Germany. Kosovo saw the latest major incident targeting Turkish political opponents in exile. In March, five Turkish teachers and a doctor linked to the Gulen movement were kidnapped in Pristina by the Turkish intelligence services. They were shoved into a vehicle, taken to Pristina airport and forced to board a private plane chartered by the Turkish services. On their arrival in Turkey, they were immediately imprisoned. The Turkish executive claims to have succeeded in bringing back 80 Gulenists from 18 different countries. Two months after his arrest, a judge ordered the release of Jevheri. Seven months later, the failed coup took place. 
He fled to Greece, clandestinely by boat. But there, the Gulenists say they are monitored, followed, even threatened. In January 2018, Jevheri left for Germany, hidden in a truck. Hello. How are you? I'm fine. What's behind you? I'm being filmed. <laughs> Every day, via encrypted messaging, he gets news of his wife and children, who have stayed behind in Greece. I spoke informally with a Greek official. He said he knew that the Turkish Secret Service operates here. He told me, you must also take care. Şu anda bir müdahale var Can Dündar'a. Silah çıkardı birisi. Vatan aynı. The man who just escaped an assassination attempt is the former editor-in-chief of Turkey's major opposition daily newspaper, Cumhuriyet. Since he fled into exile in Germany two years ago, he's become Erdogan's most famous opponent, a fact that forces him to live in hiding. You don't have any bodyguards? <laughs> well, um... I, d I wouldn't give this kind of information because uh, I'm, I'm taking some measures to protect myself. But as I told you, I mean, if they decided to do it, you can't prove it, prevent them to do it. The Turkish community in Germany has become extremely polarized, a mirror of today's Turkey that has quickly caught up with Dunda, even in his daily life. Most of the taxi drivers are Turks and Erdogan supporters. so. Taking a taxi means uh, you would face a discussion, at least, uh, with the taxi driver. And that's a problem. Same with taking underground. So how can you go somewhere uh, from your home and if you don't have a taxi or uh, walk freely on the streets? Because there are uh, Turkish intelligence services so active here. And, uh, and there are, of course, fanatics who want to be a hero in the eyes of the government. So you should be careful, of course, everywhere. The government has used the mostly supportive national media to encourage the punishment of opponents who fled abroad. Even Erdogan's son-in-law, the Minister of Energy, has incited murder. <laughs> To carry out these threats, Turkish authorities count on allies. Osman and Germania, the Ottomans of Germany, is a boxing gang created in 2014, which has branches in about 20 German cities. The organization has more than 300 members, mostly of Turkish origin, and is involved in arms trafficking, prostitution rings, violent attacks, and assassination attempts. Its most frequent targets have all been Turkish exiles. Gulenists, Kurds, left-wing activists and human rights defenders, all viewed the same way by Osman and Germania. Ulrich Hefner knows them well. He's part of a special team of 20 investigators based in three different states who keep the group under surveillance. They show themselves in numbers. They make shows of strength. They parade through the city, chanting a slogan that says, the city belongs to us. In the blink of an eye, violent clashes can break out. Last March, police led simultaneous raids in more than 60 locations across the country. 17 members of the gang were arrested, including the three leaders of the group, who are currently being tried in Stuttgart. The investigation revealed that the gang was executing orders received from abroad. We already knew from the state authorities in Hessen and North Rhine-Westphalia that there was contact with Turkey or the Turkish government. Wiretaps on the leaders of Osman and Germania revealed the identity of their financier and sponsor, Metin Kulak, a very close advisor of Erdogan. For two years now, Germany has been under pressure. Ankara has sent 123 extradition requests and a list of 300 people to be watched on their soil on behalf of Turkish intelligence. So far, Germany has turned a deaf ear. But when European countries refuse to cooperate, Turkey can play another card. 
Doran Achenler is a writer. He is German and Turkish. In August 2017, he was on a family vacation in Granada, Spain, having breakfast at the hotel, when suddenly, Spanish police arrived to arrest a criminal terrorist. They circled the hotel. The policemen, with their bulletproof vests, arrested me. When they saw an old man in shorts, they were surprised. They made phone calls to the authorities for half an hour while examining the Interpol documents. But after verification, it was indeed him that they'd come looking for. He later learned that he was placed on an Interpol red notice at the request of Turkey, permitting his arrest by police from any member state of the organization. Dogan Achenler had to wait two months under house arrest in Madrid before finally being able to return freely to Germany. While Interpol is supposed to fight crime around the world, Turkey manipulates it for political purposes. These are the headquarters of the International Criminal Police Organization in Lyon. Here we are in the Interpol Command and Coordination Center. It's a center that is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It monitors everything that happens in the world. Interpol is an interpolice communication platform serving its 192 member states, which send it names of people to look for that Interpol then publishes under red notices. Here they are. There are some here to look for, with their name, their photo, a description of why they're being sought. And, well, we'll try to stop them at a border. Is it possible that member states place a red notice by mistake and then Interpol realizes so drops the notice? The communications officer cuts the interview. In fact, under no circumstances can the organization go against the will of a member state. Back in Germany, where public gatherings involving the Turkish community are held under police protection, the atmosphere is festive, and even if pro-Kurdish opposition party protesters from the HDP say they feel watched, the speakers don't pull any punches. Pascal Meiser is a member of parliament for the left-wing German party Die Linke and denounces the government's lack of action. We demand that the government protects the people who live here, including opposition members, from these operations. There are many reasons why the German government does not completely break with Erdogan. There's the dirty deal on refugees, but also economic interests and their partnership with the NATO. Protesters here hope for an end to Recep Tayyip Erdogan's rule, because many of them have been convicted by Turkish courts. This is the case of Mustafa Kaya, a former candidate for the opposition HDP in the 2015 elections, who was sentenced to three years and nine months. The judiciary is very dependent to the political authority in Turkey. If, if Erdogan loses the power, I think the attitude of the judges will change immediately. Unfortunately, this is the case in Turkey now. So I have a hope to return to Turkey. These activists say only a political change in Turkey will end the persecution of some parts of society and of President Erdogan's opponents in Europe. Otherwise, they will be condemned to continue living in exile. Marion Pradel is here. Thank you so much for your film. Now, tell us more about the situation that these exiles are in, given that they're now wanted and being looked for by Interpol. Well, for some of these exiles, uh, namely Jan Dundar, the situation is Kafkaesque, so to say, because uh, he cannot travel anywhere. He doesn't know whether he's on the list or not. So uh, he's invited, that's what he told us, to a conference to be given in a European capital city. He doesn't know if, if he can travel, if he, he would get arrested at the airport or in the hotel he'll be, he'll be staying at. So when, when we met him and we told him that we were going to Interpol to interview them, uh, then he asked us if he could kind of record some kind of message for them that I suggest we take a look at now. I know that they applied to Interpol, but I don't know whether I am on the list or not. 
So how can I learn that I'm in the eyes of Interpol, I'm a criminal or a journalist? So I guess Interpol should decide whether they would be searching for the criminals or, uh, you know, journalists. That's why we just want to um, apply to them personally or a group because I'm not alone. There are thousands of people like me. So theoretically, there are some criteria at Interpol. Uh, so if a member state wants to put a name on a list, it shouldn't be for any political, uh, ethnical, religious, mili military reason. This is theoretical because in fact, uh, Interpol has no um, maneuver, no uh, power over the, the, the member states. The member states are in charge. They are the one uh, giving the orders to Interpol who just executes uh, the order. That's pretty much how it works. So this is also why we, 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 we could see they were so uh, un at ease uh, with that question. No wonder they didn't want to speak to you about that one. Now, obviously, these people, supporters of Gulen, have been uh, under more pressure since the failed coup attempt of 2016. Many, obviously, feeling they had to leave the country. Many have been arrested, uh, facing all sorts of criminal, uh, rather criminal procedures, judicial procedures. There have been several movements which you could describe as purges. What's been the outcome of these? What's the latest you can tell us? Well, to give you an example, lately, um, not even two weeks ago, uh, 2,000 people were sentenced uh, to jail, and among them, 1,500 were sentenced to life in jail like, without parole. Uh, and since the failed coup attempt uh, in July of 2016, uh, it was about like 55,000 people who were arrested, and uh, over 100,000 people uh, who were dismissed uh, from their jobs and positions. And of course, their crime would have been basically opposing Erdogan and his administration. That's it. Marine, thank you very much indeed for your film. Marine Pradell, of course, uh, to this week's uh, reporter. You can see Marine's film again via francefancat.com. This is Reporters on France Fancat. Stay with us.